now look to Dr. Y.V. Reddy to continue the case for the opposition. It is said that there are three ways of winning a case. Convince, confuse, corrupt. <laughs> if you can't convince, confuse. If you can't confuse, corrupt. But in high finance circles, the word corrupt is not uttered. Therefore, I will not refer to that. I think for today, clarity should convince you that the proposition deserves to be opposed. You refer to that. First, how global is the crisis? It is local in origin, but global in impact. It was in USA, UK, not in so much in Canada. It's a contagion, not the financial sector. Not so much in Australia. Europe, yes. So we must make a distinction. The crisis where it originated and crisis where it affected. It affected the global. The crisis originated in one area. And I think that's one thing we should do. Second, uh, there are a number of speakers that have referred to the regulators, monetary authorities, rating agencies, the buyers who were uh, buyers of home loan, irresponsible buyers. Well, I'm sure that there is an element of truth in each one of them. But I think the leadership is a, an important issue. The political leadership. Political leadership of which countries? In one country, the Wall Street supplies the Secretary of Treasury. Most important, what do the scholars say? The scholars say it's because of macroeconomic imbalances. So what it means is that Chinese have been working hard, saving prudently, and exporting goods and services. And then you have another country, United States of America, which has been consuming excessively. And in the process, we had what has been described as excess debt, excess leverage. Now the question is, how could one country, how could one set of institutions create that type of debt, that type of leverage, which could create a global financial crisis? The answer lies in geopolitics, political economy, and finance. The centerpiece is finance. In reality, there is a con congruence of interests of US government and Wall Street vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. That congruence explains the reasons for the crisis, reactions to the crisis, and potential for another crisis. Let us examine what is this congruence of interest. The global currency de facto is US dollar. But by law, US dollar is in the service of the US economy. Money is multiplied and leveraged by finance. Global finance is virtually controlled by Wall Street. In other words, Wall Street becomes an instrument of the US government for global operations. And US government, in turn, advances the interests of Wall Street. How does this work? Let me illustrate from my experience. As governor, in a speech, I suggested the consideration of Tobin tax, a nominal tax, so that you know what's happening in terms of global flows. Immediately, I got a call from Delhi that they are getting calls from the United States of America. And therefore, within three hours, I had to change the, my speech slightly and what is already on the website. Because it was affecting the sentiments. This suggestion was affecting the sentiments of the Wall Street. The, the exchange rate of, in, of the rupee, the stock market in India, is influenced by the sentiment of Wall Street. I, as governor, I also had the unusual privilege of receiving two secretaries of treasury in the Reserve Bank of India in Mumbai. We hosted a lunch. It was no free lunch. We paid for unsolicited advice on the liberalization of our financial sector. Where is Wall Street in this? Was Wall Street just a servant acting in the interest of its master? Or is it that the servant becomes the master. So that's what happens in reality. It is circular, it's like biology, complex, circular. In the case of Wall Street and Washington, this is what has happened. 
Now it's not something new. It was known that it was happening. The Washington Wall Street link with financial crises. The Wall Street Washington link with financial crisis was first noticed at the time of Asian crisis itself. And Jagdish Bhagavati said, Professor Jagdish Bhagavati in 1998 of Columbia University, he called it Wall Street Treasury Complex. In UK, in 2004, Professor Robert Wade of London School of Economics described it as Wall Street Treasury IMF Complex. In 2009, after the global financial crisis, Professor Simon Johnson acknowledged the role of, quote, Wall Street Treasury Corridor in the global crisis. Incidentally, Professor Johnson is former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund. In brief, Wall Street was certainly not acting alone, but even its ardent supporters cannot deny the vital role of Wall Street in this crisis. Logically, therefore, Wall Street cannot but be critical to the reform of the system. What were the reactions to the crisis? Well, as mentioned, there was an expression to occupy Wall Street movement. When it subsided, the expression, the expression of blame disappeared. But the problem and distrust persists. What has changed in about a decade after all this? Too big to fail banks remain, more or less intact. Central banks and regulators are still reluctant to honor financial markets. The promised and agreed reform for reforms have remained largely unfulfilled. The legislative changes made have been diluted over a period in terms of various regulations. And above all, above all, the ecosystem of the Wall Street, Washington, IMF, World Bank remains in place. In other words, the world has paid a heavy price for Wall Street's reckless behavior that led to the crisis. It was not blamed enough even after the crisis. After the catastrophic event, billions of dollars were paid as penalty without admission of guilt. More importantly, the assured reforms have not taken place. Let us consider what is the cost of this inadequate reform. What has happened? I'll, have, I'll focus on one, one consequence. China had built up large amounts of forex reserves, which were invested mostly in financial assets till recently. Of late, what is it doing? It's, in this, it's shifting from financial assets to physical assets. It's building, it's buying infrastructure. It is buying roads. It's having bilateral agreements by which these are executed. The, the, the disputes are settled bilaterally. And it's in Remnambi. So, and China is doing all this in spite of high risk, low, low liquidity. It's high risk, low, liquid, low liquidity is associated, and they are all inter-country. But this may be for political reasons also, but it has significant economic consequences. The economic consequences are that we are almost on the verge of a, a large amount of activity bypassing the global financial system. It has started. It's picking up. Can the world afford to have a global financial system that is being bypassed by the second largest economy in the world? Incidentally, China's unique financial system and many of us believe it's a non-system, is being showcased as better in serving the real economy. This is contrasted with Wall Street model of finance. Let me therefore say, what next? Global finance has to be right-sized. It has to be repositioned qualitatively. Global finance has to be made inclusive rather than elitist. Global finance cannot be an end in itself. It has to serve the economy and the society. All this cannot happen unless there is a pressure on the denizens of high finance and Wall Street. As one, as one speaker mentioned, you have to blame the Wall Street to save the Wall Street. I urge that we do not regret blaming the Wall Street for the global financial crisis. We should regret not blaming enough to spur its reform. The proposition deserves to be opposed. Thank you. Great.